Hello everyone and welcome to Mining Now. I am your host Gus Miner. We're here live at CIM 2023 in Montreal and we are joined with two special guests here today from Osenko. Uh, we have the senior consultant Jeffrey Bouchard-Gorin and uh, we've also got the director of asset optimizations Eric Denelm. Welcome gentlemen to the show. Thank you guys. Thank you How have things been going so far with the event? Yeah, on my end, it's pretty good. So again, it's good to be back with the, with the conference like this after the, the COVID and all that. And I'm missing some people the, for so many years and having the chance to, to again, to see what's going on in the industry and all that. So that's pretty, pretty interesting on my side. Yeah, so it's great that you had an awesome turnout with your presentations. And, uh, and I think, you know, with the conversation we're having today, we're really looking at finding out, like, what is it that Osenko is up to? And, and what are the exciting statements that you're bringing to, uh, to CIM and also unveiling to, uh, to the mining sector as well as oil and gas? Uh, what, uh, what's brewing? So we're a division within Osenko, Osenko being an engineering consulting and product delivery company. Been around for 30 years. Um, they span 26 offices over 15 countries. And we're around 150 people in our division globally. So I'm more looking at operational readiness. Eric has all of Canada in terms of asset optimization. And we work closely with clients, mainly in the mining and metallurgical industries, uh, to making sure that they're ready on the client side when the project is over. So it's a whole process that goes anywhere from 12 months to two years for us for operational readiness. And um, we're very much hands-on with the client at site, supporting them and all their different department managers to making sure that they're successful when the project is over. Excellent. Yeah, and from my side to Adam Jeffrey. So Jeffrey takes care of like the operational readiness for a new project, new sites and all that. But we're the resource for him inside the maintenance and asset management. So we do what we call the maintenance readiness. That's part of the operational readiness. But uh, we're not only limited to the project and all that and the, the support work with the OR group, but we also take care of uh, any other asset management consulting with the industry, uh, mining industry, but any type of industry was still uh, working in all type of industry in our business. So we have, uh, yeah, again, a pretty wide range of uh, service offering and uh, that we're going to give to our clients. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's basically the, uh, our group, uh, how it's uh, set up. In a nutshell. So I guess you know through that operational readiness, I mean something that we've uh, we've had such an impact lately with you know the movement to electrification and the the footprint recognitions of the the landscape of mine sites, especially the fact that we have to produce so much more than ever before. Um, I guess that's a lot of what you guys are offering as well as uh, minimizing the footprint, expanding the productivity while doing that. It, there's a concept to that for sure. I think it's more looking at the whole 360 degree view of what the operation is going to look like at startup. Um, a lot of people they don't. They think it's OR is associated to just commissioning or spare parts or uh, inventory, but it's really the full gamut of what each department needs to bring to the table to make sure that the handover is done properly. A lot of conversations start off with, well, what is our core and non-core non business and where, what's our strategy at the beginning to determine where we want to go? You had mentioned electrification. Well, we need to do that at the beginning, you know, 24, 36 months early on so that when it comes to procurement, we are able to get those trucks that are highly uh, in demand from all the different miners, you know, and also regionally, if you're competing with other miners, you're competing for labor and workforce, you need to make sure that that's been identified into your HR strategy. So um, all these discussions typically happen at the OR assessment phase, which is early on, typically around that feasibility, pre-feasibility. And then from there, that goes into the operation readiness plan. And then we look to execute that plan and make changes as we go along. But a lot of what you mentioned before, it needs to be top of mind with the corporate team so that we can then execute it here with the team locally and then be successful because we can't change strategies when we're in execution. And that's where we have problems because it's too late. Typically to, to hire, typically when we're too late on hiring or too late on procurement, there's no working backwards. Right, and from a change management process as well, like if you go from project to operations and then all of a sudden you have to retrofit or you have to upgrade all your assets. Yeah. I can see that being a very, very challenging situation. Yeah. yeah, and it's the same for us in asset management. There's so many things we can do prior to the commissioning and the startup of the site. A lot of things need to be ready in order for you to be cost effective when it's time to operate and maintain your equipment. And some example of that that we do, uh, uh, we, there's a process we call the RAM analysis process. RAM stands for reliability, availability, and maintainability. So, uh, so we can take your the design from the engineers and look at the uh, what we call the uh, the process flow diagrams, look at the design they've made so we can model all those assets. Okay. And sometimes we use software to do that type of work, but we can modelize the design. We, we kind of uh, estimate the durability of each of the asset part of the design and the system. And at the end, we can tell you how many 
tons of ounces you're going to produce at the end of the year, what you can expect from the design that you do. And then we can do multiple scenarios. We can, let's say we have a pump, it's, we have a single pump in line in the process. What happens with, we had a second one in parallel. So I think two pumps parallel will be more reliable than just with one pump. So, but what's the cost to add this pump, okay, versus the amount of additional production we get at the end? So is there a payback to do that? So you can all optimize your design from the engineering side and you're more likely to have this, the expected results after the commissioning with what you have designed. Because if you don't do that upfront, realize later, hey, finally I needed a backup pump or parallel pump in my system. Do I have the place to put it? Okay, is there a building big, big enough and all that? All the piping I have will have to change a lot of design. So it's gonna cost you much more afterwards to do those changes. Now you have tools and you have things you can do up front and for you to get a better design when it's time to maintain and operate, like you said, and get full value from, from your design at the end. No, that's excellent. And I guess yeah. I, I guess the warehousing as well, like the warehousing management falls into that. I mean, a lot of the projects that I've done in the mine sites where, you know, I walk in and there's 10 or 15 or 20 of the same parts with, and sometimes it's just because, you know, they were available, so we're going to stock them. But then the yeah. project ends or the operation ends and you got all of these spare parts that's, you don't know what to do with them because now they're maybe obsolete or uh, and there's no return. Is that something that you look at as well? Is like yeah. how do we maintain its spare parts? It is the same with the design. So you try to have spec design spec that you give to your OEM uh, vendors that pro that give you the produce you your asset and all that. So you make sure also there is a certain standardization. If you know that some companies are reliable for you, you have experience with them and all that. And I would like as many of my supplier or vendor or OEM use those components. So at the end, it reduces the amount of spare I need to take in stock because I have some level of standardization to be done. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just coming back to the point. So yeah, they, they, again, it's just an example. This what spares and, and optimization. There's a lot of things also we can look at prior to the uh, the start of our sites. Yeah. And in our OR plan, we'll determine that as well, right? We'll talk about, well, what's your consignment strategy? What are we doing here with spare selection? And then based on what the consignment strategy is, that'll determine also your inventory size and, and what you can do for the warehouse. And typically what we find is, you know, some juniors sometimes will will look to save some money. We'll look at the warehousing, we'll look at spares as well. And then they'll also look at strategic partnerships from the vendors and seeing here, well, what's the minimal spares that I can get off with for the first two years? Then as we, you know, as we sell more and we're more successful here, then they look at changing their strategy as well. And they're also looking at financing deals, but all that's captured originally here so that there are no surprises. And so that can also staff up your warehousing team accordingly. But we've, we've talked a lot about that yesterday, actually, and give a few examples from projects that we've been in that, you know, unfortunately, you know, they had to make some compromises, but at least that was captured on and that was well communicated. And that's the whole point. We don't want to have any surprises come in here during execution, realize that, you know, we're $50 million short. Well, what do we do? And then it becomes a panic. So spare selection, you know, consignment, that's, that's a lot of what we look at in terms of maintenance and also in terms of the procurement for the, for the owner's team. That's great. And I guess from a project standpoint as well, I mean, we go from feasibility, feasibility studies and we, we have a really good plan to execute. And then it seems like, you know, too often <laughs> the, yeah. the goalposts get moved, right? Yeah. And then it has a significant impact on your time of delivery and, and more specifically on your budget. Uh, it, you know, I've seen some projects where it really mm -hmm. gets out of hand. Um, so I guess with those best practices and the data that you've had from all those projects that you've been managing uh, around the world, I guess that's something that you're bringing to the table as well. Yeah. So when we're in execution, every department has what we call critical tasks not only on the long lead path, but what are items that we know we can't move. And then when you look at reporting and tracking, we've instigated dashboards for our clients that clearly highlights in red, which ones are the critical tasks and which ones are we behind on, right? And we would review this either on a weekly or biweekly basis with the teams. And asset optimization and the maintenance team would also have their own set of critical tasks as well. And then from there, we make sure that we don't slip on those. And we have full management sponsorship and visibility to make sure that we're not just looking at these in silos, you know, as a little small OR team, but we're looking at it with the greater team, taking consideration, for example, VPs or, or people from the board, and we're providing them with summarized reports, to give them a really good idea of how we're progressing and where we might be at risk. Because operational readiness is a risk mitigation strategy and tool that we use. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, exactly uh, right, uh, Geoffrey. So, yeah, it, it's all about getting uh, ready as much in advance as you can. So at the study stage, you need to, you need to think about how we're going to operate and maintain this diesel installation that we're building and all that. So, so the earlier you think about it, 
and you make sure that afterwards in the next phase of the project there will be like budget missing because there's things they didn't take about before and now you need additional budget yeah. to, to get those those elements done and all that so we want to avoid avoid all of this so think really early in a project what you are going to do at operation and maintenance down the road uh, after commissioning and then it will help you a lot to, to make sure you don't forget any important point that can have an impact on your schedule and your cost for the project right and critical tasks are not just physical items like spares or assets or infrastructure they're also tied to important hiring milestones as well right exactly. because when we need to hire certain team yeah. members that will start implementing the systems well those people those positions become critical tasks same thing with setting up certain processes and systems right when we look at setting up an erp which which we've done on other projects here even recently that's a long process you know that's a long lead we can't just leave that to chance and and we can't just leave that to the end that's something that usually takes multiple iterations is always longer than we think yeah and um, and that's something that we've supported as well you know talking about big players like scp and the scp pm function we have specialists within our team that do this on multiple different fronts right not just integrating helping with the integrating looking at the strategy building the maintenance tactics that eric is going to talk a bit more about later on but you know that's something that you know critical tasks are not just hey i'm selecting my spares on time or i'm building this asset on time there's a whole gamut that falls under or that we need to consider exactly exactly i mean there's no sense of having all the assets in the right spots and nobody to be in the seats yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? That's right. Uh, yeah. and and yeah like and to your point of those sap rollouts and and those those systemic uh solutions that they require a lot of config configurations and, and yeah. sometimes customizations and it, it can throw you off guard right oh yeah so uh, and it's good and again you can have the best or plan and maintenance maintenance plan in the world but at the end also after the commissioning you need to make sure even if you have trained all the people you have all those system defined and set up and all that when it's time to operate it so are you sure that all your people will really know what they need to do or to get, get the plant working and started and all that so so at this phase also it's also critical to have sufficient amount of expert and resource uh, to be able to facilitate and, and lead those those uh, those startup uh, for the operation because there's so many uh, things that can happen there could be failure there could be events you did not expect yeah. it uh, uh, when you start to operate so yeah. you need to make sure you don't forget the long-term plan okay and just look at right. day to day what's going on today so so you'll need some also expertise uh, at that stage as well when you get to operation right on that vision delivery right yeah kind of like your, your group yeah so that's why when you have those people that know about operation and maintenance are involved in the OR project, the maintenance from this project is going to be a much better project because there's the one at the end that's going to live with what you have done. Right. So if we have done things not the right way, so we'll have to change it back later. And, and again, it's cost and all that we won't have the time and money to do that. So you need to make sure that you take the right decision from the start. So we need to avoid those, all those changes that could be required. It's definitely a mindset. Not everyone, you know, it, can be put into a situation like this and be successful in terms of a startup and that energy that comes with it. And having a short-term project mentality isn't really what we're looking for and what would be the ideal candidates to help support this. Because typically in the project environment is very fast track, mm -hmm. you're very short-term thinking, you're delivering up to a certain scope and you're so focused on the scope that if there's any changes and it becomes a bit catastrophic, there's a bit of a back and forth and, yeah. and iterations with OR and, and maintenance readiness that we wanna make sure that you know, as we're going along, like Eric said, we have that long-term vision and we're successful and always thinking about, you know, how would I set up, you know, my kitchen if I were to do a home reno, for example, mm -hmm. you know, I want to make sure that everything is in alignment and that have the buy-in from, from your partner, right? And from, you know, your children, if you have children, but it's a whole, it's a whole family affair because ultimately you're going to live in that house for a while. And it's the same thing here in operations, right? Yeah. When we're setting ourselves up, it's not just for the first six months after yeah. we've proven that we've ramped up successfully it's hey we want to sustain operations and we want to have you know the documentation that's in place we want to have a successful warehouse right yeah. we want to have our maintenance capabilities that are established we don't want to retrain half of our workforce because we weren't successful on that right we don't want to hire a bunch of service providers to come do some of our work you know we want to be able to be sustainable right right so that's that's a big component i guess habit formations Right, like habit yeah. formation, so it becomes a, a very repeatable pattern. And from what I'm hearing right now, so I've got a pretty in-depth uh, sports background, yeah. and and I, I I always you know come back to the dieting stage, right, where it, a lot of times you'll have like an objective, whether it's an event, whether it's a contest, whether hey I'm going to the Olympics, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and it's a very very finite 
time schedule and a very finite path. So you're able to stick with it. But then if they say you, you got to maintain this now and, and be healthy for 75 years, yeah, yeah. Yeah. things kind of, it's, 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 it's a tough one, hard. right? Uh, and you have some practices, you better get in right from the start, because if you let people take bad behaviors at the startup, at the, the operation and all that, later try to change that back to where you want, where your vision is, it would be probably a big challenge. So if you can, from the start, everybody align on your vision and all this and make sure those things will happen and people be trained and coached on, on, on this vision. So it will make your operation much more efficient and much quicker and for the long term. Yeah, from a cultural alignment and, yeah. it, and it becomes That's a right. social behavior. Yeah. This is the yeah. social behavior the culture of being, from yeah. the company. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So so through your risk mitigation plans and through your risk assessments and your, and your, and your uh, operational readiness plans, are you able to share maybe one or two things that you saw as a uh, as a consequence or an impact that you didn't foresee that we should you know uh, consider, but also not necessarily a consequence that was negative, but a consequence that was very positive that you didn't see uh, actually being a possibility until it actually happened? Do you have any of those moments where you're like, "Wow, well, that's pretty cool. We didn't see that happening." <laughs> yeah, um, I'd, I'd say the the biggest thing for us is there are a few lingering deliverables that needed some change and needed some support from the from the pro, from the management team here at the client side that didn't necessarily happen as quickly as we'd like um if i were to take an example from a project that we worked on you know we talked about warehousing but that whole warehousing component sometimes it, it could be quite expensive right and sometimes it's not viewed as a value add so the the running gag in one of our projects was that we would store the spares outside in the snow and then when we need them we'd shovel them out and then we'd, we'd use them right so i think I think for us, I mean, one of the items here, if I if take your question, is we we didn't get the, the level of ownership that we wanted on the warehouse uh, on that example for that project, for that client, right? Um, and the mitigation strategy was just going playing all the secants, right? That's that's really what it was and, and right. making sure that at least we have somewhere that we can store and that we can find a creative way to use the project team secants and use that as a temporary solution just as we, as we get into operations, right? So you don't have to go chisel your parts out That's of here. Right. Right? At least, at least we have yeah. the, the bare basics. And I think, yeah. And some components, if they are stored properly in the right environment, they're going to deteriorate. So the day you want to use them, they won't be uh, working. So you have to reorder other ones. So, so it's still critical for some parts to be stored uh, the right way. That, I think the strategy with that client was more was also in the summerish period. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't that critical to have a warehouse yeah. at this moment. But yeah. Eric is definitely yeah. right with, with regards to storing parts, especially longer term. And we've seen claims go against certain companies that will procure ahead of time and then have their spares, you know, there in warehouses yeah. and then yeah. not have pro the proper care and maintenance, which is a big component as well. And brand a, new used. Yeah. Eh? Brand new <laughs> used, that's right. Yeah. Because we had another project with the, with the client and the project was delays. But we got all those equipment and parts to receive already. But again, we didn't have any spares, a place for the warehouse. We're not finished and all built on that. So we had all those spares all over the place, different location. So we had to send a team of people that will go look at those spares, which one are critical, which one we, we should make sure they are protected, you know, for, for having deterioration and all that. So, so we had to do that course because the project was delays and we were overwhelmed with, with a lot of materials equipment that we could not install right away. So, so yeah, so we had. We needed a mitigation plan for, for, yeah. for when it yeah. happened and all that. So, Get yeah. out of the reactive state, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, is there something wonderful that you've actually had to happen where you know you've had all your right plans in place and then the intent was to achieve X, but then somehow this happened and we didn't see that coming? <laughs> uh, that was a very positive output. Uh, yeah, again, it depends. The, the bad thing on our side and our business at some time, you know, when the project's delivered and all that, we're not always involved in project. We don't have always the proceed to see. Uh, the results of what we have built with Develop. It's, right. Of course, we we hear from clients, and and I remember one project in asset management we did in, in the past and uh, in my in my past experience on my side. And so we implemented some best practices at that site, and this has improved a lot the range time of the employees. Okay, so they're getting more efficient because all the work was planned and scheduled, organized, and all that. They had all the parts material they needed was already kitted and prepared and all that. So the efficiency of the tradesman has involved by so much that later on, the client after like six, nine months, he called us back. Hey, finally, I don't have enough work for all my people. So what do I do? <laughs> so so by the end, that's an example of a good outcome from the yeah, thing absolutely. that we do to improve efficiency and all that. So we said, okay, no, uh, let us have a look. Maybe those guys can be put on more uh, value added tasks that can improve still your fresh later. And that site was located in an area where uh, sometimes they will uh, auto industry was pulling out some of the resource, you know, and uh, and uh, also 
a lot of the workforce was uh, retiring in the f next few years to come. Say, oh, don't get rid of your, your team because uh, you, you'll need a minimum staff later on. But we found value at the task to these guys to be done and just improved more on the top that was already done. So that's an example of type of uh, yeah. rewards that we get mm -hmm. in the projects. And yeah. what a great impact it has on a culture because yeah. everybody feels like they're right. winning. Oh, yeah. right? and, then, and then they're... Then you start realizing, wow, we did spend a lot of time before firefighting. Yeah. We did spend a lot of time being re uh, reactive. Yeah. And uh, and then and then you, you bring you bring any challenge to them, and they're like, oh yeah, we'll knock it out of the park. So that yeah. that is a great story. Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's one one positive share that we can take also from another project that we worked on together, where Eric had seconded some team members to operational readiness here for a client that also required a lot of maintenance readiness work. Um, we had their whole mobile fleet, their whole fixed plant fleet that we were doing. We also did some cataloging as well. You talked about spares and not knowing how many you have or having a lot of duplicates. Well, when you have a catalog that's well set up, you essentially don't have that problem, right? Yeah. Because you come in prepared. Yeah. And your bolts are well described. They're not just one light on that says this is a bolt or this is a yeah. wrench or, you know, this is a this is a filter press, right? It, it goes into a lot more details. But I think one thing that we looked at is, you know, with Eric's team and the systems that we have in place with the planning that we did, you know, we took six, six consultants over a year and a half, and we were very upfront with the client as to what our timelines were. And we also participated in the integration, but over that year and a half with diligent planning and the best practices that we had, we were able to not only do all the strategies for the mobile and fixed plants, but have that integrated in their SAP. We also had, we sent a person to do on-field validations, um, which is, which was something that the client really appreciated because these can often just become desktop exercise yeah. that we do remotely. And we wanted to get the buy-in from the client, from the trade. So we had people go on site, you know, print these out, do the walk downs, making sure that the corrections are put back in and really that whole life cycle here during OR that we were able to do. And that was a success um, given the challenges that we had and the timeline and the pressure. So. You know, it, it was really thanks to the systems that Eric put together and the team members that and he developed. So it was a great success. Yeah. yeah. So at the end, the, the tradesmen get accurate, like inspection sees and all that. So, so it's very important yeah. to gain credibility with the system, because if you happen to receive documents that are not accurate for what you see in the field, you know, you have a mismatch mis right there and you look lose trust from the, from the tradesmen. That's so right. it's really important to, to be accurate on that. Because we're always like that, right? The second yeah. one, if you look at even, you know, some notes, the second that your first sentence is wrong, you think the whole note is wrong, <laughs> exactly. right? So very, very easily when you when you get to startup, you're looking at these maintenance um, tactics and you're thinking to yourself, well, this is all wrong. Yeah. And then the whole program is scrapped. And next thing you know, your name is in the mud, right? Yeah. So exactly. You want to definitely avoid that at the beginning. And this is the same at the beginning. Again, we're not perfect from the start. So yes, we could have missed a few things. So we expect to have feedback from the trades and the people. But if they write feedback, nobody take care of it, do the change in the system, they will lose credibility right away. They won't give you any more feedback. So all this relationship and that's uh, really, really important as well to, to get the success. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of planning that goes into it, right? You have to identify the quantity of work that goes into just getting the strategies prepared, mobilize the support that you need, but also on the client side, have the supervisors and tradesmen available earlier than just the day that you operate. Yeah. Right? And, that, and that's the thing, because if we had no tradesmen, we had made the analogy before, if we had no tradesmen to, to be there to do the validation, you know, a few months before, that would be a lost opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And then they come in a little bit late and then next thing you know, they'd inherit whatever they'd inherit and then they'd have no no feedback, no buy-in. And then that whole, you know, that, that cultural experience of, hey, I'm putting into this startup and, I, and I'm investing my time and it's really my, you know, my tactics, my plan, and you lose some of that. So Yeah. And then, yeah. And then the culture starts to cascade right behind it. Right. I mean, yeah. one of the things that I talked about a lot with my team as well internally is that systems will set you free. Mm -hmm. right? And you're like, well, what do you mean? And so because it becomes the backbone of everything you do. And when you feel like you're in the wilderness or you feel like you're kind of losing your way, yeah. you can always depend on the system that's there to bring you back on track. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. As the same, like you said, uh, so you need so, to have some uh, assessment or auditing tools down the road to make sure you keep track with what was uh, design and the vision you had. So again, people are people. So sometimes we try to take shortcuts and all that. <laughs> so we need to correct the behavior, you know, when they happen and all that. It's really important because if we let go, everybody do what they think it's best. What so we're gonna have chaos, the chaos down the road. So we need to make sure that, yeah, everybody is aligned. So we have our uh, uh, assessment tools and all that, and we make sure everybody uh, keeps on, on the plan we built and all that, and keep track on this. Exactly. Yeah. Every good team needs a good set of coaches. They can't all yeah. be coaches. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, agreed. Okay. So then, I know as as we start wrapping things up, are, are there any things from uh, from what's going on right now with uh, with Osenko that you want to bring forward and and uh, talk about with our viewers uh, that you know they want to consider that we haven't touched on? 
On my side, maybe one element would be interesting to discuss. Uh, as we go also during the engineering design, a different stage of the project, uh, we'd like to have like reality review to be to be performed. So we have a checklist, we have a list of items we want to validate. But again, it's all to think about uh, very often about maintainability. So how I'm going to be able to inspect that component of that piece of equipment? Do I have access to it? Do I need a man lift each time I need to have to check it? Or do I need a platform yeah. to get that? If I have components to replace, do I have all the tools, the beams, the hoist above it for me to do my job? So this is also an important part of, of the design, looking the reality review and, and make sure you're designing your, also your asset to be reliable so you can work with your OEM uh, when they design assets, especially for you. So make sure that the, uh, well, their design will also be uh, reliable. So, and we can perform like uh, things like what we call RCM, reality center maintenance. So, uh, so uh, activities on those assets to make sure we identify all the potential failure mode. We got the right corrective action, or sometimes we need to change the design because uh, we're not sure that we're going to get the reality that we need for that asset to be uh, to be uh, performing well in our uh, system and our production process. So, so again, it's all other aspects that we can look at the design phase of project uh, to ensure you got better product at the end. Yeah, I guess you got that. You got a you know two segments. You got the routine tasks and the non-routine tasks. Yeah. And what do we have there to support? Because normally, where things start falling apart is a non-routine stuff, right? Yeah. There, you, you had everything in line at the beginning, and then two years goes down the road, and you finally have to do that task, and then the procedure is, where is it? And yeah. and so that's very, very important. I, I like that. Yeah. I think for us here, when it comes to operation readiness, is just breaking some of the stereotypes and opening up the conversation because not a lot of people are aware of what's required. There are no standards, let's say, for operation readiness like there are for maintenance. It's a bit of a, of a black science to certain people. A lot of people associated with commissioning, they just say, well, operation readiness is just support during commissioning. It's whatever procedures we'll just put together quickly. It's the support and checking maybe the performance guarantees and then it's and then that's all right and mm -hmm. like we talked a bit about today and like we talked on our short course yesterday it's more getting that education and that knowledge out and realizing that the project team is not going to do all this for you and i think that's a common misconception same thing on the on the maintenance side people often mm -hmm. think that the project teams will automatically send you all the vendor information and it really depends on the contract and the project team will help you with some of some of all your your, your best practices in terms of maintenance to set you up um, the project team will buy your spare parts, and typically it's only the, the commissioning spares in most contracts, and, and that will really depend. But I think it's more understanding that, you know, operation readiness isn't just spare parts and just isn't just the warehouse and isn't just these things that the arch, these archetypes that we're used to talking about. Yeah. It's really the whole view um, starting earlier, ideally, you know, and like I said, in feasibility, if we can, and pre-feasibility, depending on, you know, the, the, the project and the budgets allowed. But now they're being required for AFEs at the conceptual stage, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of bigger projects are asking for OR and also maintenance component for AFE approvals, right? And it's it's becoming a lot more important for bankers, for board members to look into this, to see here if you've actually considered, you know, what the client team is going to look like during the project phase. So I think it's just, it's earlier than you think, and it's not just certain specific tasks um, and it's just the whole involvement and in getting that sponsorship from the client team and it's going to quickly become as as important as the project itself and i yeah. think more and more people are realizing that like yeah. the performance sustainability right yeah and again again today we just talk about some of the or elements some of the asset management there's also all the safety environment finance right. uh, yeah. supply chain so there's a lot of things that needs to be looked at at the uh, that's right at the early phase of project and all that as well so so yeah it's, so the scope is quite large in our <laughs> business of what we do yeah and again the more you can do and think about is always going to be the best for you uh, for success for yeah. sure and, and the great thing about if i can add to that eric the great thing about osenko is that we also have there's a lot of smes that are on hand that have that specialty in training for example or in, or in hr um you know yeah. in, in mining operations obviously in maintenance, putting a few of these other things that we typically have called on during, you know, engagements to say, Hey, we need you for three months to get, you know, the client team organized and to help them develop some of these procedures or develop some of these strategic documents and, and, you know, be more of a, of a sounding board for some of the questions that they have, because not everyone has been through this before, right? The startup, like we had mentioned is, is a different environment mm -hmm. and it's not, not everyone has been that typically you, you're in operations, right? It's tr traditional rural you're in operations. We haven't participated in that whole startup phase during the project team. So, you know, we have the SMEs on hand to come and support um, as required, uh, depending, you know, on where the project is and, and the requirements um, and the challenges faced by the client team.
Yeah. Very good. Very good. So what I'm hearing is that there's no better day than now. Yeah, that's right. And that Osenko has your back for <laughs> today's delivery and the future. Sure. Is that correct? That sounds great. That sounds really right on. Good. Well, I thank you very much, gentlemen, great. for coming on board. It was an amazing conversation. I learned a lot from uh, for Sen for Senko and also what's going on in the world um, as far as uh, long term sustainability with the demand that we have out there. Yeah. So, thank awesome. you for coming on. Thanks, Gus. Appreciate it. Right on. Thank you. So there we have it. Another great episode with uh, Mining Now at uh, CIM 2023. And uh, looking forward to uh, all of your comments and everything uh, that you can put below the, the video. And we'll catch you on the next episode.